Praise the Lord, everyone. I am excited to be here today, and thank you for battling this half an inch of snow to get here today. I looked outside, and I'm like, oh, boy. And then I get outside, and I'm like, this is just a little bit for us Chicago people that's used to this kind of weather. Amen. Today's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord, and I don't know about you, but I have been enjoying this series of Let the Weak Say I Am Strong. And I really think that God has, has been speaking to us. I feel it's a very timely subject for all of us and uh, for the church today. And, and I want to go along the themes today and give us something to, to focus on today. And, and, um, and I really believe that God has something for us today. I believe that by the end of this service, God's going to do something for you specifically, individually and uniquely. And I know you could say, well, that's how it's supposed to be every service. And that's true. But sometimes we get distracted. And sometimes we think about what has to happen next. I'm I'm very guilty of that. I begin to think about what I got to do when I get home and what I got to do next week. And and sometimes I can just be guilty of that. Can I just be transparent today? I begin to read in the scripture, and it's kind of right along the lines of your Bible reading program, by the way. What a powerful thing to be a part of because I believe today's subject falls right in line with our Bible reading program. And I want to just challenge you, if you haven't started, it's not too late. You can catch up really quickly and be a part of that. But in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 28, we understand the story of where where Isaac anointed Jacob and blessed him. And we find that Jacob starts running running from his brother, running from his problems. And, and the scripture says that he takes off and, and he finds a place where he falls asleep and he dreams. And the Lord begins to speak to him for the very first time. The first time him as a man, God speaks directly to him, one-on-one. And the scripture says that Jacob wakes up and his word says this, surely the Lord was in this place. And I knew it not. Or basically, if I could just paraphrase it, I had something so special, so incredible in the presence of God. And the Bible says that Jacob called that place Bethel. And he built an altar there. And he anointed that that place. I flip over a few chapters in the Bible. And we find that Jacob finds himself somewhat in a nearly similar situation. And he returns to the place of Bethel. And the Bible says there when he returned to the place of Bethel that God began to speak to him again. And God talked to him. And Jacob arose again and anointed that place and built an altar there. And that place was Bethel. Here's what I'm trying to convey today. I know that every one of you in this place have a relationship with God. I know every one of you could say, I've been serving God a long time. And I understand the word of the Lord sometimes. We like to think, you know, I'm doing this. This is what, you know, I'm committed to God. I have a relationship with God. But could it be that God wants to take us back to that original place where he spoke to us for the very first time? I want your mind and your memory to go back to that first encounter you had with God. Do you remember how special it was? You may not have even understand the magnitude of what God was doing in your life. And you may not even understand how he was speaking to you. And you woke up per se and said, surely the Lord was here and I knew it not. Or or better said, I didn't comprehend what God was doing in my life as I do today. But here's what you did comprehend. That you had an encounter with God. That there was something in that first interaction with God that was so special and so unique. And you hungered and thirsted. And your desire just to reach God. And your desire to be in the presence of God was so real. 
You see, we're talking about let the weak say I'm strong in my devotion. And I believe that God wants to take us back to that place where we first encountered Him and renew our our burdens and our passions and our desires to know God like never before and to experience God like never before and to have His presence rush over us like never before. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens by choice. You see, Jacob said in Genesis 35, let us arise and return to Bethel. His decision was to get back to the place where I know where God's at. Get back to the place where I can have an encounter with God. Get back to the place where I can renew my presence and my spirit in God. You want to know what's going to happen today? Oh, we're going to sing some songs and worship our great God. We're going to take our knees before the presence of God. God's word's going to go forth and speak. But here's what's going to happen today. I believe somebody's life is about to be a, a change in the presence of God. I believe that somebody is about to have an encounter like they once did. And it's going to cement their relationship forever. That means that those that say, you know, God, I've, I've, I've experienced you, and God, I've seen you speak in my life, but I'm coming back to a place, God, where I'm so passionate for you, and I'm coming back to a place, God, where I'm so hungry for you, and I desire, God, more than anything today, God, to know you, and to know your power, and to know your resurrection in my life. Amen. Amen. I know I started this service off heavy today, but I believe that the presence of God is resting in this place already. And I feel the Holy Ghost moving already among these pews. And I see people saying, that's me. This is where I'm at. I want God right now more than I ever have before. If that's your prayer today, why don't you stand with me with our hands raised, with our hearts committed today. Oh God, we desire God in this house today, God, to know you, God, to experience you today, God. God, I don't come into this house today, God, with just God out of habit, God, or out of God obligation, God. But I've come today, Lord, to know you, God. I've come to experience you today. God, our hearts, God, are so hungry, God, today for your presence more than ever before, God, in any other time, God. We've got to know you. We've got to have an encounter with you, God. And I pray, God, for every person, God, on Facebook, God, and YouTube, and every person in this building, God, that their commitment today, God, is going to be settled today. Their devotion to you, God, is settled today. God, that you're bringing them to a place where you're confirming your word, God. You're confirming your promises today. God, you're God settling, God, in their mind and their spirit. What you're going to do, God, in their life. And we believe it today. And we profess it today with our faith today, God. I may not see, God, the end result, God. But oh, my faith is renewed in the Holy Ghost today. My faith is renewed in your presence today. It's going to happen today. Somebody, God's going to have an encounter. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands right now and worship God in this place. Come on with your voices and with your hearts today. God, we worship you that's on the throne. The one that speaks to us, God. The one that God ministers today. You are the Almighty. You are in control. God, your promises are yea and amen. In Jesus' name.
justified Free me forever One day he's coming back for oh, glorious day Living he loved me Dying he saved me Bearing he carried my sins far away Rising he justified Free me forever One day he's coming back for oh, glorious day Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As they've said a million times before, we read the back of the book, and who wins? Amen. We win. Amen. So glad to know that what he started way back on Calvary, he's going to finish. He's going to come back one day, take us out of here. But until then, thank the Lord, we can have victory here on earth because he's victorious. Is that right? We can. We can have victory in all things because he has overcome. That means we can overcome. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated if you'd like. If not, stand and worship. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I'm serving knows only how to triumph. Yes, hallelujah. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down to any giant. I know how this story is. Yes, I know. Victory for the battle. 
take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Sing it again. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, you do. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord.
is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Oh God, we worship you, Lord God. Oh God, God, it's in our worship, Lord Jesus. It's in our worship, God. It's in our lifting you up, Lord God. That's how we fight our battles, Lord God. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we worship you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift you up, Lord God. You have guaranteed us the victory, Lord God. You are the King, Lord. You are the one that we lift up, Jesus. Oh, we magnify you, Lord. We worship you, Lord God. We worship you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That song is to encourage somebody. That song is to encourage somebody. Somebody's fighting a battle today. Somebody lost a job this year or lost finances. Somebody's struggling to see a family member saved. Somebody's struggling with emotional issues. This is how we fight our battles. We worship you, Lord God. We worship you, Lord. We hope in you, Lord God. We hope in you, Lord Jesus. I can run against a troop. Yes. By my God, I can leap amen. over a wall. Yes. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all those who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me in high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. We have the victory in our worship today. We have that victory. We have that confidence. Thank you, Jesus. We know, we know that we are going to see a victory, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Let's just go into a time of prayer. Lord God, we worship you today. 
Lord, we want to be strong, God, today. Strong in our devotions, God. Strong in worshiping you, Lord. Strong in our trust in you, God, today, Lord Jesus. Lord, for by you, God, we can, God, run against the true glory. Lord, we believe in that, Lord, that we can leap over a wall today, Jesus. Lord, you have made us strong, God. You have made us strong, Lord. Lord, we are not weak. We are mighty, God, according to your name, God. God, there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war that he wages, he's going to win. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we believe that today. We believe that today, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If we could remember Pastor Cardwell some prayer today. We want to remember him. We're so thankful for what God is doing in Nancy and Joel's life. But let's just pray for Brother Cardwell. Lord God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. God, that you're able to minister unto this man of God, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for moving on his behalf, God. God, touch his body, Lord God. God, continue to work in his life, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that today, and we worship you in Jesus' name. if you can.
Praise God. Amen. The scripture says, though your sins be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool, white as snow. Praise God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. But it was not possible for blood, the blood of bulls and goats to completely remove sin. And so there had to be a supreme sacrifice. The Lamb of God was slain. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, came, died on that cross, shed his blood. And now we have redemption through his blood. Hallelujah. And I tell you what, friend, that blood can forgive anything. It can forgive anything. Glory to God. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. Before we get into the word of the Lord today, I do want to uh, say how wonderful it is to have the Favel family with us. Give them a big hand. Always good to have them. God bless them today. Amen. Amen. Uh, but their family is uh, going through a season here, and uh, we just want to remember them in prayer. Brother Benjamin Favel uh, comes from a... Uh, a family, his mom and dad, tremendous apostolic believers, and um, uh, his father is nearing his promotion, and uh, so be keeping them in prayer. I have loved and honored John Favel all my life, all that I've known him, and uh, those of you that uh, Sister Betty do, quite familiar, and Janet Streck and others, quite familiar uh, with um, the Favel family, and, and uh, we just let you know, we got you, we're going to be praying for you. Amen. Believe in the Lord. Just going to help him. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. Thank the Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Good to have Brother Randy Wellman Sr. with us here today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Quite a, quite a week, but praise the Lord. Doing fine in the Lord. And everybody else that's here today in the house of the Lord. What a wonderful service we had last week, baptizing Sylvia in Jesus' name, back again today. Glory to God. We thank the Lord for her and everyone else. Amen. That uh, here, Cecilia, God bless you. Seth, and as that, hey, Gabby back there. Hey, we just, it's just good to see everybody here in the house of the Lord today. <laughs> Hallelujah. If I left you out or, I, or you're hiding behind somebody and I don't see you, Amen. That's all right. We're glad you're here as well. Stand together with me in the word of the Lord. Turn to Joel chapter number one. Joel chapter number one. And we are going to look at the 14th verse today as we continue this series on the book of Joel. As we are focusing primarily on Joel chapter number three and um, verse number 10, which is, let the weak say I am strong, but we have been looking at all of the ways in which God strengthened his people in just these short three chapters so that they could reach that point of recognizing their strength cometh from the Lord, and that's where our strength comes from. Amen. We're not going to get strength from anywhere else but from the Lord. If we don't get it from the Lord, then we're always going to be weak. You'll never be strong enough by yourself. Never. Never, ever count on your own strength. And uh, to depend upon one's strength is, is very much a sign of uh, unbelief. But as you and I trust in the Lord and, and draw from Him, His strength is perfect when our strength is small. He will give a strength to you. Amen. And uh, when we come to realize that, sometimes even as believers, we are prone to trust ourselves because we've been in church a while or we know a few things, and, um, but that can be detrimental and damaging as well. Amen. The only strength I have today, the only good that's in me, anything that I can offer you today, amen, is only that which God has given. Praise the Lord. Joel chapter number 1 and verse number 14. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Amen. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Praise God. For a little context there, I'd like for you also to look at the, next, the preceding verse. The verse 13. Gird yourselves 
And what's that next word? Oh, you don't see it on there yet. But gird yourselves and lament. If you have your Bibles open, you'll see that. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of God. And so then he commanded them to sanctify that fast. We're going to be looking at one aspect of strength today that comes to the believer, and that is through our consecration. Let the weak say, I am strong in consecration. Lord God Almighty, we thank you today for every good and perfect gift cometh from you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of walking with you in truth and in righteousness. And we ask you, God, today, amen, to cause this word to be heard in our hearts, not just in our ears. And it will change us, we believe, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Turn around, smile and wave, somebody that's around you today. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Lord bless you. Two weeks ago, we began this series, Let the Weak Say I Am Strong, by understanding the need to be people of conviction. Everyone say conviction. Conviction is so necessary because we live in a day and an hour in which everything is up for debate. If we aren't convicted of truth, if we don't have convictions about how we are to live for God in these days, then we will not last. And then we noticed how that it is from our convictions that our confession comes. Let the weak say, I am strong. The weak can say, I am strong all day long and not really feel it unless there's conviction. But once conviction is in your heart, then your confession has power behind it. Conviction and confession helps us then to really understand the depths of our consecration, a consecration before the Lord. I want to say this right at the beginning of our message, and you'll see the picture behind me. We so appreciate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a man of conviction, a man of confession, And a man of consecration. An individual has not started living, he said, until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. And I think we ought to take a moment right now to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank God. Three times in the book of Joel, the command to sanctify is given. We find sanctifying a fast two times, chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 15. And then sanctifying a congregation, chapter 2, verse number 16. To sanctify means to make sacred or holy to set apart to a holy or religious purpose, to consecrate by appropriate rites, to hallow. Also goes on to say to make free from sin or to cleanse from moral corruption and pollution, to render productive in holiness and piety, to sanctify something, to set something apart for God. Ninety-one times in Scripture we'll see the word sanctify. You'll recognize just a few that I have chosen here today. Exodus 29 and verse number 44, the Lord said to Moses, I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. The establishment of 
this tabernacle in the wilderness. It would be more than just a tent. It would be the very throne of God amongst them. A place where they would meet with God. The Shekinah glory of God would rest in a visible manifestation there as a cloud and a fire. And they would encircle about this tabernacle. Their tents all on would encompass about it and they would view it as the center of their nation. But God said, before I receive this, I must sanctify it. Jesus said in John 17, verses 17 through 19, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also send them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 5 verse 25 and 26 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Necessary process. The church had to be cleansed. The church had to be washed. Washing of the water by the word. And then Peter writing in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always, always ready, to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meek, and fear, sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts means more than just letting God dwell amongst all the other idols, letting God have a place amongst all the other special things that we have accumulated over the years. But rather to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts means that He has the first place, the only significant place that there could be in our heart, that nothing else in all of our heart can compare to the Lord God. First, the center, the most important of all. For something to be sanctified or consecrated means that it has been devoted to God. Leviticus 27 and 28, notwithstanding no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beasts and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. Once something has been devoted unto the Lord, it's not to be taken back. It's not to be later than sold. Amen. It is the Lord's. It's not for sale. It's the Lord's. There are things about our lives that are not to be for sale because they're the Lord's. We belong to Him. We treat ourselves with a a special understanding and appreciation because we're not our own. We're bought with a price. Therefore, we glorify God in our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. Therefore, we're very careful about how we treat our bodies. Amen. What we consume, whether it be in form of media or or food or drink or whatever it may be, all things, all things that we partake of, all things that we allow our attention to be drawn to, all things that that we desire, must be held against the standard of the fact I am a new creature in Christ. I am born again. I am a cleansed individual. I don't want to bring any unclean thing into my temple. Amen. I don't want to bring any unclean thing into my life. And so once you begin to see who you really are, it changes how you see everything else. Amen. You begin to have a different viewpoint altogether and perspective on the world for you recognize there's in this world things that can awaken the lusts that are to be held back, held down. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those things 
are not of God, but they're of the world. And they bring into the one that, that uh, participates in such distance and sin, separation from God. We find in Leviticus 27 and 28 a devoted people. There's devoted places and devoted things. People, places, and things can be devoted unto God. Ordinary things become holy unto the Lord because it's been devoted unto God. Amen. It has a different sense of sacredness because it's been devoted to God. Amen. You, you appreciate it differently because it's been devoted unto God. If you are a giver today, if you are practicing stewardship and you receive a paycheck or some sort of money, you look at that and you recognize the tenth or the tithe of that. It's something that you have decided this gets devoted to God. This is my way of honoring God with the increase that I have. And so you don't look at the whole thing. You look at just the 90 that's left over, the 90%. And you say, that, that I can utilize. The 10th, that's devoted to God. That belongs to Him. Amen. We look at our time as well and we, I pray, are separating times in our day that we say, you know what, that particular hour or, or that particular time of the day that's when I seek God and that's when I call upon the Lord I I don't want to do anything in that time I don't want anything to get between me and God in that moment amen it's devoted time it's devoted treasures amen it's it's devoted places hallelujah whether it's some kind of a prayer closet that that you shut in with God in that secret place or whether it's A building like this that's been devoted unto God. We show a a proper sense of respect even for, amen, bricks and mortar and wooden beams and carpets. All these elements are found in other places that we inhabit. But yet here there is a special respect and honor. And you do well whenever you consider the house of God as being a place that's devoted unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. And how we treat it is, is so, so very important. How we give honor to it is so, so very important. How we come in and how we go out and how we, how we are here. It's, it's something that we showed tremendous respect for. Because it's been devoted to God. Now, someday down the road, if we outgrow this building and we sell it, and it becomes a, a, a building for somebody else's use, then those owners will decide how they're going to use this particular location. And the next place we would go, then we would honor it by devoting it to God. It's not just a particular location alone. It's not particular, um, uh, like I mentioned, it's not particular bricks and mortar. It's, It's what it means to us and God. There are things that have special Value because it's you and God that meet there. Remember when, whenever Jacob was fleeing from Esau and he found himself growing tired in the wilderness and he laid down on some rocks and while he was sleeping, the Bible says, the dream came to him and there was a ladder that was uh, from heaven to earth and upon it angels were descending and ascending it. When Jacob awoke in the morning, he devoted that place to God, gave it a name by the name of Bethel, which means the house of God. And from that point on, it forever was in his life and in his children's life, a special place, an honored place, a place that he would revisit again. And the second time that he would visit it, he would not only call it Bethel, but he would call it El Bethel. For not only now was it the house of God, but there in Elbethel, he had understood the God of the house. It's one thing to have a house of God, but it's another thing to have God in your house. It's another thing altogether to to recognize the God that you serve is amongst you in great power and great glory. And I'm going somewhere because in Joel, we find a people that had a house of God, but they did not have God in their house. Hang with me. 
Ordinary things becoming holy because of this devotion. Ordinary things not for sale. Israel was a nation that was devoted to God, yet we so often find them rebelling against God. They were requiring chastening to repent. And this is true in the book of Joel. We see a spiritual famine that is in Israel that has now opened a door to a physical famine brought on by a plague of locusts. Friend, we ought to be just as concerned about spiritual famines as we are physical famines. Amen. We better be just as concerned about the lostness of our community as we, as we are if our community's jobs begin to close down. Amen. A spiritual famine was in the land, but yet it didn't really alter the life of Israel as much as did those locusts that began to come in in droves and plague them. Joel 1 and 6, For a nation has come upon the land, strong and without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion. He hath the cheek teeth of a, of a great lion. Amen. The prophet referred to these locusts as a nation. A nation that was just coming in with great power. A nation that was coming in and was bringing about a slow death. First to die was the grapevines and, and, the, and the fields that had been planted. Those were the first to die. But friend, you go very long at all without food growing in your field and you will die. There's a nation that came in and attacked them in that area of their resources. Nation of locusts. But along with this nation of locusts, we find there was also human enemies of Israel. Surrounding nations were taking advantage of the predicament to come in. And according to Joel chapter 3 verses 5 through 6, they plundered Israel's silver and gold and, and goodly pleasant things as the Bible refers to them. They would enslave and traffic their children as well. This isn't how living as God's chosen people was supposed to look like. To be overwhelmed, to be consumed by plagues, to have enemies able to come in and go, come and go as they please. This is not how it was supposed to be. God hadn't made them his people and then said, well, figure it out on your own. No. They were the children of God. They were supposed to have the blessings and the protection and the favor of God, but yet God wasn't amongst them in the manner that he desired to be. Now this was beyond the regular trials and tribulations of life. All of us, all of us find that there are going to be seasons of life in which we go through rough patches, whether it's physical or financial, whatever it may be, we all have ups and downs. That's normal part of living life. But this was beyond the pale. This was, this was irregular. Yet sometimes we allow what is irregular to then become Regular. We, 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 we allow that which is not normal to become our new normal. And sadly, our resistance to this new normal wanes and we begin to accept things. We begin to accept it as that's just life now. That's just how it's been and going to be. This is my life. And there's way too many people that are saying this is my life when God's saying you don't even know what life could be like if you would serve me. You don't even know how I could bless you. You don't even know how I could help you. Amen. You're accepting this as new normal. And you're living far below what blessings God could give you. Amen. You've accepted that it's going to be this way. That I, I, I can't change it. It's not going to be any different. Friend, don't listen to the devil's lie. The devil wants you and I to live far below what God has for us. But our resistance to the changes oftentimes wanes and we begin to accept it. Until finally, there is awakened within the right people a force. So powerful is this force. That it becomes a disruptor to the way things are. The normal of the day gets attacked by this force, this power. What is this powerful disruptor? I say today it's found in Joel chapter number 1 and verse number 13. 
where the word of the Lord says, gird yourselves and lament. Lament. Lament? You mean lament? That's the powerful force that can reawaken a nation? That, that's the start of, of this journey back to God? What is lament? Lament is defined as grief or sorrow that's expressed in complaints and cries. It's lamentations. It is a wailing, a moaning, a weeping. And the Bible says that Joel the prophet gave a word to the priests. And he said, it's time for you to begin to lament. What was worthy of such lament? What got this started? Well, it was the loss of God's favor, yes. It was the famine, yes. It was war and even more war to come, yes. That's why the word of the Lord goes on to say, Come and lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. And then it goes on to list this, For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Lament. Lament for the loss of God's favor. Lament for the famine and the war. And lament for the fact that the offerings have been withholden from the house of your God. The priests who were there to receive the offerings had nothing to offer now in the house of God. Their job was to take the offerings and offer it unto the Lord. But now there wasn't coming in the, the meat offerings and the drink offerings. So they begin to realize, all right, we've, we've got an issue now. We've got a problem. We don't have anything to offer to God. The nation had lost God's favor. But as long as they had something to give, they felt they were okay. Follow me here. They had lost God's favor. But the priests didn't sound any alarms. The priests weren't lamenting anything. Nobody was making a big deal about it. Oh, everybody was complaining. Yes, we don't like this. Oh, it's horrible. I don't know if we're going to have a crop this year. I hope I got enough in the storage bin to last one more season without a crop this year. Oh, I, things are going to change, hopefully. The, I, I, I pray that, that, that the Chaldeans don't come down again and steal more of my kids and, and so forth. I just hate them, Chaldeans. I wish something would be done about them, but... As long as they're still carrying their little meat offerings and drink offerings and the priests are taking it. Yeah, I know it's bad, but oh, we're going we're gonna to put it on the altar. We're going to sacrifice it to God. Oh, all right, oh, I'll take your off. Okay. Oh, everything seemed to be okay in the eyes of the priests as long as there was still things being put on that brazen altar. Even though God's favor had left them. The priests themselves didn't even acknowledge it. What if you lose God's favor because you're backslidden, but still for a time have a little money and a job and health? You even give a little of that treasure to God's house and you visit it on occasion. It's still a part of your routine. You know, religion can continue on and on and on and on and on. Religion can continue on indefinitely. As long as you've got a little bit yet to do. I, I got Sunday morning open at 1030. I can go to the house of God. I, I got a little offering I can bring to the Lord and put it in an offering plate. I'm doing all right. I, I've got a little health in my body. I, I could feel like maybe going to, to, to worship God in prayer today in my prayer closet. I, I, I got this. I got that. As long as, long as, as we still have a little bit that we think we're giving God. As if God is up there in heaven needing our offering. As if God is going without. It's almost like we're feeding God. We're pumping quarters in the casino slot machine. Pulling the handle. I got a little bit to give you, God. I still got something to give you, God. They felt they were okay. The priest didn't even make a big deal about it. It's true that only when we hit bottom do we really begin to lament. Right. It's true that when we make a list of all we've lost along the way, hey man, this is, this is what we've lost. Look at what we've lost. 
When is what we have lost going to bother us enough? I mean, some things we just put in the loss column and say, well, you know, it's some years are good years and some years are bad years. Next year, we'll, we'll get it all back. Like it's stock market or something. One day it's down, the next day it's up. And we live in this whole realm of just saying, well, okay, okay, sirrah, sirrah. Whatever will be, will be. Future's not mine. I don't know. I just... We just continue, continue to to put things in lost columns, but it doesn't bring about a cry. How many people have got a backslide before a church wakes up and says, what's going on? Where's the people at? How many people have got to? How many people have got to go in, uh, into all kinds of trouble and trial and pain and sorrow before somebody says, well, 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 "Isn't there prayer going on somewhere? Isn't there fasting going on? Isn't somebody crying?" I don't want to make lists of people that have been lost along the way and it not bother me. How much more do you have to lose? Before you acknowledge I've got a problem. I sat right over there on that front pew. With an individual one time crying his eyes out. He came at the end of a service. Somebody from many, 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 many years. Years and years ago in my childhood. He was addicted to gambling. He had lost more money than I'll ever make. And he sat there and he wept and he wept and he wept. He had so many debts that he literally had people after him. You you hear that in movies, but this guy was telling me, he said, I've got people after me. He said, I can't can't just go down the road like you. He said, I've got to be, I'm watching over. He was banned from so many casinos in Las Vegas and different places. And he wept because he had once been a, a child of God. He had been raised in truth. He was wanting to repent and I prayed with him and we touched God together and he cried and cried and cried even more. He got up and he left. Sadly, I heard months later that he had got back into that lifestyle. How much do you have to lose before you say, I'm, I'm addicted? How much do you have to lose before you say, I, 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 I got a problem. How, how much? How many friends do you have to lose? How much money do you have to lose? How far down does your health have to go before you finally wake up and say, I've got an issue here. God, I've left you. God, I've left you. But sadly, so many people will just keep filling up the lost column of life, thinking, well, that's just that's the way it is. Things are bad all over. It's always going to be this way. Who was called to lament first, though? The priests. The priests. They were called to sleep in their sackcloth. But lest you think this is just a message for myself and some of the other ministers that might be in this building or a part of this congregation, I remind you, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Ye also, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are priests unto the Lord. If you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you are saved, amen, you have a holy priesthood. Position. First Peter 4 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The first people that must be awakened to the reality of the world around them going down, 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 down into the depths is the church of the living God. The first voices that need to be raised up in alarm. Amen. The first eyes that need to spill tears must be ours. The first people that must say, listen, this isn't normal. 
What are we doing here? We've even left off common sense. Now we're getting into the demonic. This isn't right. As long as the church is going along. Sometimes the church just rides along with the world as it goes down the, down the river. Because we got a little bit of jingle jangle in our wallet. And we can keep the lights on and we can keep the heat on. And we got a few people in the pews. And, and you know what? Maybe, maybe things will reverse on their own. No, 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 no. There's a call of lament. Lament must be the first thing. Somebody has to be bothered enough to say, you know what? We can't have this anymore. We can't just keep going along as normal. We can't just keep playing games. This is bad. This is troubling. That was the first thing. Then the second thing that the prophet called them to do was to sanctify a fast. Notice this. Fasting in the midst of a famine? Does that make sense? It seems excessive to fast in the midst of a famine. But desperate times call for drastic measures. We typically fast as a short break from our fullness. I'm preaching to you and me. It's easy to fast when I've got a wife that can go into the pantry after the fast is over and pull out delicious food and feed my fat belly. It's easy. It's easy to fast when you're already counting down the days to when the fast is over and you know, oh, it's going to be good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad Pastor Cox lets us take the weekends off of our fasting in January. We're eating good Saturday and Sunday. We fast out of our fullness. We don't fast in famines. You don't fast in a famine. Why would you do that? Fasting in a famine from the little food they had left was God's way of challenging their thinking and their allegiance. It would help them truly to see the famine was more spiritual than physical. It helped us to realize there's a spiritual famine. Because God would call me to do something, but I would say, but God, I just got crumbs anyway. I just got crumbs anyway. Why why are you keeping me from my crumbs? Because I'm the God that can bring your crumbs to life and fill your pantries and fill your table. Come over here where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord. But you're over here with crumbs. I, I'm not going to fast. I got, I got to eat these crumbs. I got to stay with my crumbs. How many people today are living on crumbs? Satisfied with crumbs because they... They won't hear the call of God. They won't hear the command of God. Priests were called to to, to fast in a famine. So they would truly understand, we got a spiritual famine going on. We got a problem here. Crumbs, eating crumbs are a type of self-preservation. Are you after self-preservation or are you after God's will? I'll stay over here with the crumbs because as long as I got a little bit of crumbs, I'm, I can preserve myself. I, God, you're wanting me to fast. God, you're wanting me to do this. God, but no, I got to stay over here because this is my livelihood. This is, this is who, this is the life I've made for myself. Self-preservation? Is that what we're after? Or God's will? Fasting in a famine will reveal which is more important to us. God's view of fasting involves abstinence from food as well as the challenge to our self-centeredness and our self-preservation. Isaiah picked up this 
theme from God in Isaiah 58 verses 4 through 8. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice be heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Question, is not this the fast that I have chosen? Loose the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burdens. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Deal your bread to the hungry. And that thou bring the poor that are cast out into your house. When you see the naked, you clothe them. And when you hide not yourself from your own flesh, this is the fast God is wanting. And at that point, he said, then your light shall break forth as the morning and thy health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Amen. What changes in us because of fasting? What changes? What conflicts happen because of fasting and prayer and faithfulness to God? What idols do we realize we're living with and worshiping when we're called to pray fast or leave out from the crumbs and go after the things of God? Fasting in the midst of a famine. The third thing the prophet told them to do was to call for a solemn assembly. Israel had many special occasions throughout their year. There were seven feasts that were observed annually. They were celebrated in this order. They had Passover. They had unleavened bread. They had first fruits. They had Pentecost. They had trumpets. They had atonement. They had tabernacles. These seven things were on their regular programming of a year. It was what they were used to. It was a part of their rituals and habits. But when a solemn assembly is called, this was something out of the ordinary. This was something not on the calendar. This was an extra sacrifice. This was something that was called for because of desperate times. And that's where we find the people that Joel is writing to. The solemn assembly was in addition, in addition to their pre-scheduled observances. A solemn assembly is a gathering of people for a sacred purpose, a sacred occasion. And in these solemn assemblies, they would, they would purify themselves before the Lord. They would observe the need for holiness in their life. And on those days, they would do no work as well. All of the work was to be left undone. Not only was God calling them to fast in a famine, He commanded them not to even work for a while. And when you understand that they were sensing as if they had to work all day and even in the night just to get the little that they had, to stop work almost meant to lose life. To stop work. What do you mean? To get out of my, my, my routine. What do you mean? We have all these habits and old habits die hard and routines can, can so often turn into ruts, right? Right? Solemn assemblies call us out of our routine. Solemn assemblies say, leave that behind. Solemn assembly says, your work that you think is so important can last another day. You can leave off of that. Solemn assembly says they're going to have a, a fast in times of a famine. Joel 1, 15 and 16, Alas for the day, it is the day of the Lord at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, even joy and gladness from the house of God? The priests had an understanding now that destruction from the Almighty was coming, and, and, and we're just going to keep eating the crumbs and working the barren fields? We think, we, we think somehow that, that we're going to be able to have a prophet? Joy and gladness has been cut off from the house of God just as the offerings were cut off from the house of God according to the scripture we read there. The question is, does the house of God produce joy and gladness in us? Does the house of God produce joy and gladness? Does living for God produce joy and gladness in us? And does it do so even in a famine? Or do we have a different altogether feeling about serving God when we're in a famine. 
I love the Lord. I worship Him. I give Him praise and glory. And oh man, my wallet's full. My body feels strong. My family's doing good. Woo! It's easy to serve God with a full belly. It's easy. But what about joy and gladness in the famine? Preaching about consecration today. We're going to get to where we understand how the weak can say be strong because of their consecration. But right now we've got to understand some things that need to be consecrated to God because we'll never get strong a strength that will last unless along with our convictions and our confessions we have a consecrated life. Joel 2 and 1, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. An alarm's to be sounded from the holy place. They blew trumpets often. Trumpets had different sounds and their different purposes. But here was a trumpet in Zion. This was a trumpet from the house of God, from the presence of God. This attracted their attention to another direction altogether. It pulled their eyes towards Zion one more time. Oh, that we would have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. An alarm from the holy place must be heard. We have to have the ability to hear the alarm from the holy place. And the Bible says the inhabitants of the land tremble. Does the alarm from the holy place cause us to tremble as it used to? Amen. The priests blew that trumpet. The alarm was sounded. We need to hear it. And not only do we need to hear it, but the lost need to hear it as well. Amen. We need a fresh revelation to the alarm. Amen. And we need this revelation to alarm us concerning the lost souls of men. There are people out there in this world that don't like you. They don't care for your God. They don't care nothing for your, your relationship with God, the religion you practice. They don't care nothing for the Bible that you hold dear. They mock you and they like, make fun of you. But friend, just because they're denying a God in heaven doesn't mean that they can somehow get a pass from having to stand before that God someday. They might turn a deaf ear to the alarm for a while. But friend, we better keep blowing the alarm. We better keep sounding the alarm. Because as long as it keeps our knees to the ground, as long as it keeps us doing the the Lord's work, something good may happen in our world. We better be careful that we don't allow the things that are happening in our world presently to divide us from people. Just because they may have this viewpoint or that viewpoint, this lifestyle or that lifestyle, and it may be so easy for us to to judge them from the perspective of, of our position in Christ. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot dare do that. They're still our brothers and sisters. Does anybody deserve to go to hell? Does anybody? No, friend, don't you be nobody's judge. And don't you be nobody's jury. Let God be the judge. You're a witness. You're a witness. And the things that get the judge mad at the witnesses when the witnesses aren't witnessing. we got to witness to everybody, even if they don't like us, even if they don't care for our church, even if they don't care about what we believe in. It's still not going to divide us. We cannot allow the spirit of the age, which is division. Spirit of the age. Let's divide the races. The spirit of the age, let's divide them politically. The spirit of the age, let's divide them economically. The spirit of the age, let's divide, 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 divide. And if we're not careful, we'll get on one side. Everybody around here looks like me, votes like me, talks like me, acts like me. I'm, I'm comfortable over here. These are my people. Those over there. They're on the devil's side. They're just people. They're just people. They're just people with a soul. 
They're just people that maybe have had their eyes blinded for a while. They're just people that have got some hurts that they can't get over. They're just people that's been through some things and it's caused them to, to, not, to, to not know what they believe. They're just people. They're just people. They're just lost people. They're just searching people. As long as we're over here judging them with their homosexuality, judging them with their secularism, judging them with their agnosticism, their atheism, judging them, say, let them get a taste of this. Let them taste that little bit of hell before they go to hell. If there's anybody at all that you would like to see burn in the fires of hell, there's something wrong with you. And wrong with me. If there's anybody that we would just assume stand by and mock and laugh and say, okay, God, flick him into the fire. There's something wrong with that. That means we're not lamenting. That's what we're not doing. We're not lamenting. Because when you're a lamenting person, you view others that are different from you in a slight of love. It says, I don't want to be your enemy. I don't want to hate you. I don't want you to hate me. Can't we find common ground? Isn't there some way that maybe we can have a conversation? Maybe some way or another. I, maybe you won't take this book, but maybe, maybe my life can be a living epistle. Maybe some way or another I can represent Christ to you. Amen. The spirit of this age wants to take the church out of the world. I'm listening for a trumpet. You better believe it. I know one of these days he's going to split the eastern sky. You better believe it. But there's another trumpet I better be hearing as well. And that's the trumpet from Zion. That's telling me God's going to judge this world. And your cousins and your brothers and your sisters and your neighbors are standing in the line of that which is going to be judged. Do you care? Do we care? Are we saying, well, they're going to get, (laughs) reap what you sow. Tried to tell you. God help us. God help us. We got to hear the sound from, from Zion. The world that's shaking their fist at God doesn't need a church that's shaking their fist at them. Fourth command is found in Joel 2.16. Sanctify the congregation. Sanctify the congregation. Priests, you've got sanctified. You've got the people together. You blew the trumpet. Now all the congregation, all the people, everybody, everybody, the whole nation, anybody that will come, everybody, bring them, bring them. Get everybody. Sanctify them. The sanctifying of the congregation would bring renewal. It would bring revival. And it would cause God to revisit. Why should God continue to walk amongst us? Why? Why should God continue to visit with us? Why Why should God continue to be our God? And how long would it take us to notice if He was gone? How long could you continue on as you are without God? How long would religion take you down the road? So many Christians are running on fumes. Fumes of last year's revival. Fumes of last year's prayer meeting. Fumes, 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 fumes. But as long as the engine keeps turning over, they think they're all right. They're being signaled by their fuel gauge that they're out of gas. But I've still got something. I'm still going. You and I can't run on fumes. We have to seek God. God judges the church as well as the world. 
We don't get a free pass. God spoke to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, verses 4 through 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Why? Why should God keep a candlestick at first apostolic church of Staker? If we leave our first love, if we don't go back to the place and positions that we've held in God, if we don't repent, he said, I'll remove your candlestick. How long could we carry on without a candlestick? God spoke to the church in Laodicea in Revelations 3.15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarm, lukewarm, lukewarm. It's hard to be lukewarm and lamenting at the same time. When you are lamenting, you are keeping a spiritual fire burning. Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Friend, we got to go back to God as our first love. We have to go back to him as being the center of our joy. He still is the fairest of 10,000 to our soul. He must still be the lily of our valley, our rose of Sharon, our bright and morning star, our fountain of living water, on and on and on these things. We must see him as such. Hallelujah, Sister Cox, as you come. The fifth command of Joel. Joel 2.17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep, weep between the porch and the altar. Sorry today, you can't preach this kind of message in a sermonette fashion. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? The priests, again, that's all of us. Weeping. That's what we should be doing. Where? Where? In a place known as the distance between the porch and the altar. Sometimes it's sometimes in the course of the priest's duties they spent most of their day back amongst the tables of showbread in the holy place. Not the holy of holies, but in the holy place. Before the altar of incense, which was before the veil. They got to spend a lot of time back there in that area around the the lamps. But you couldn't see them in there. That was beyond the view of the porch. The people would come with their animals and they could only go so far. They would come up the porch. The priests would meet them and take their offering and go to that brazen altar fire put their offering if they were to had an animal sacrifice upon that altar they would throw their offering if it was a drink offering into the air throw it against the altar where's the priest supposed to be the priests are supposed to be out front in view Brothers and sisters, there's a a lot about our worship and there's a lot about our relationship with God that is private. And necessarily so. We don't do our alms to be seen before men. We don't want everybody to know when we're doing different things. We're not out for human accolades. But when you get to a desperate time with trumpets blaring 
and locusts buzzing. And the armies of the enemies coming down and stealing your kids and trafficking them away. The place for the priests is not to be huddled in their building, but to be out between the porch and the altar in a highly visible place. Not with an expression on your face that says, hey, we're good. Everything's fine. No worries. No concerns. Just carry on. No. But when priests whose eyes are looking in both dimensions of the physical as well as the spiritual, when priests that have an understanding of the Word of God and the condition of men, when priests who know judgment's coming, when priests who know these things get out there between the porch and the altar, they're to weep. Weeping and interceding. Tears falling like rivers down your eyes. Weeping. Weeping. We must be a people that weep. We must be a people that weep. Joel was probably written during that second temple period when it would have been Zerubbabel's rebuilt temple. The porch was that public entrance area, the brazen altars where the animals were sacrificed. There in that highly visible area, they were to weep as an example of public intercession. What is the church known for? We're known to be salt and light and bloodshot eyes. I wonder if the church still understands that the power of our tears is greater than our political allegiances and joining uprisings and doing all kinds of other things. When will we understand? There's power in our tears. There's power in our tears. Somebody's got to cry for what's been lost. Somebody's got to weep and mourn and fast in a famine. Somebody's got to gird themselves in sackcloth and sleep all night uncomfortable. Somebody, 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 somebody. That's what this world needs. Psalms 126 and 6, He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall... Come again with rejoicing. What? You mean there's some good news? What? You mean, you mean there is a time in which sheaves are going to grow again? There's a time in which the harvest is going to come back? Yes. There's a promise of rejoicing. There's a promise of God's response to our lament. We're not ever, forever going to be known as Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. We're not going to have to write the book of Lamentations and that be known for all we ever wrote. But we're going to come again rejoicing, rejoicing, lamenting, lamenting, lamenting leads to rejoicing. If you're rejoicing without lamentation, then your rejoicing is going to be short-lived. But but if you're rejoicing as a result of the fact that you've been weeping and calling solemn assemblies and coming together with other people to humble yourself in holiness before the Lord, Hearing that sound. And weeping between the porch and the altar. You will end up rejoicing. For Joel 3.16. The Lord also shall roar. Roar. Out of Zion. 
At first it was the trumpets, now it's the roar. At first it was the alarm, but now it's a different sound altogether. It's, a, it's not a trumpet, it's a, it sounds like a lion. Lion, lion of God, the roar of God. And he shall utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of his children in Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine. And the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord. Where is it going to come out of? The house of the Lord. How does that fountain erupt? I believe that fountain erupts from the house of the Lord when the priests are weeping and lamenting. And then all of a sudden, they realize gathering about their feet is not the wetness of the ground because of their tears, but because the spring of living water. Spring is springing up. And a dry and thirsty land begins to have water. Water. Could it be, could it be, could it be that out of you shall flow rivers of living water? Milk and honey. God's roar will be heard. God's roar will be heard. And the humble will appreciate it. 1 Peter 5 and 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. We sang it a little while ago, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle, the battle is the Lord's. We have to realize the battle is the Lord's. And there is going to be victory. And right now you may not see victory. And right now all you may see is famine and enemy Right now, all you may see is trouble and problems. But what can change this world? What can bring about a last day revival? Is when you and I begin to get tired of writing things down in the lost column. Well, we lost this. We lost that. We lost this. We lost that. Well, that's just the way it is. And somebody starts lamenting. Because when you start lamenting the things that you've lost, you get them back. You get them back. God restores. God renews. God revives. How are we going to get America back? America back to what? It's been a long time since America has been really, truly a nation as we were Envision to be, but you want to see America as it could be. Don't think you just need to take it back to the 1950s or the 1910s or the 1850s or the 1700s. No, 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 no. Get America back. Get America to where God wants her to be. We're going to have to do some lamenting. We're going to have to do some weeping. We're going to have to do some public weeping. A world that's shaking their fist. That God doesn't need a church shaking their fist at them. The church has got to have tears in our faces. It's been so easy at times for us to put ourselves in some kind of stance. Argumentative, judgmental, angry. We've lost sight of where our power comes from. What makes us distinctly different is that we have a role before God. He's not asking you and I to fight this battle like maybe others are. He's asking you and I to fight our battles, fight this battle, lamenting, weeping, interceding. And you know what? We're going to have to go out and publicly do it. Out there on the porch, out there in the front, out there in a place where others can see. I don't know if I want to ask you to stand or just turn and kneel in your pew right now. I don't know if maybe someone would come down to the front. 
and kneel at the altar area. We have room for 10 or 12 of you down here. Maybe you just want to sit there and close your eyes and ask yourself this question. Am I truly living a consecrated life? Am I living a consecrated life? And corporately, we need to ask ourselves as a church this question. Are we a consecrated church? Are we living a consecrated life before God? Are we pursuing the things of God, holiness and righteousness? Do we love these things? Oh, friend, why don't you reach out to God right now? Amen. Reach out to God right now. How long has it been? How long has it been since you lamented? How long has it been since you started calling out upon God, saying, I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of this being taken from me. I can't carry on like normal. I can't continue on as I have been. I can't just assume this is what's going to be forever. I've got to get busy. Consecration. Consecration. Fasting. Fasting and famine. Fasting and famine. Taking a day off of work. Leaving my crumbs behind. What about my self-preservation? What about just having enough for me? It's got a little meal and a barrel and some oil and a cruise and a couple sticks, just enough to make one more meal. Then we're going to die. Till the prophet says, well, why don't we have a meal together and then you'll eat again for the rest of your life. Oh, God. Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. Hallelujah. Holy How much do you have to lose, friend? How much do you need to lose? Amen overtake us. You're the one we live for. We can't afford to lose anymore. We can't afford Holy to lose anymore. Holy Spirit lead us to your heart, oh Jesus. There is nothing we want more. Jesus name. Jesus name. Holy Jesus. Spirit break Jesus. us. Come and Jesus. overtake Jesus. us. You're the one Jesus. we're living for. Jesus name. Have you heard the burden of the Lord today? Holy Spirit Hear the burden of the Lord today. To your heart, oh Jesus. Hear the alarm. There is nothing we want more. Hear the trumpet as it comes we from Zion. Want more. Alarm, an alarm, an alarm. An alarm wakes the church up, an alarm. We want wakes the intercessors more. up, an alarm. An alarm. Teach us how to live. Beyond ourselves, oh God. let everything we say and do, my God, my God, my God, my bring God, glory to Your name and bless Your heart. God, show us how to love like You. Strip away my pride. And my selfishness Take me back to my first love Oh, I'm falling on my knees Now I confess That you will always be enough Oh, Holy Spirit for Holy Spirit lead us to your heart oh Jesus there is nothing we want more oh Holy Spirit break us come and overtake us you're the one we're living for Holy Spirit, lead us to your heart, oh Jesus, there is nothing.
fire. All we need is more of you. For the Lord is good and his love endures. Yes, the Lord is good forever, and I'll shout it out from the mountain tops. Yes, the Lord is good forever, for the Lord is good, and His love endures. Yes, the Lord. As you win. 
God, help us to understand that we can change the world. The church, the church truly anointed to do that can make a difference, change the world. But it's not going to be maybe the change that you imagine it to be. Whenever we get to weeping, lamenting, sanctifying ourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah drawing closer to God, hearing His voice, being obedient to Him. We'll give God an opportunity to visit this world presently like He did. And oh, hallelujah, things changed. Things changed. Things changed when the priests began to lament. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I feel the witness in my spirit that this message has resonated today. We've heard from the Lord today. Let's just clap our hands to Him today. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Amen. Thursday night, for all that can gather, we'll hit a few of these key points again, maybe add a couple other little sub-points that we weren't able to get to by because of length today. And then we'll spend some more time in prayer. Amen. I did announce the other day that uh, final Sunday of the month, uh, we'll be preaching about let the weak say I am strong, strong in community. And at the conclusion of that message, we will be taking communion together. And uh, so we want you to be aware of that. Amen. We hope you can make it uh, this Thursday, next Sunday. Also, you might have received an email from the uh, church office uh, just reminding us about Christmas for Christ. What a tremendous opportunity to give so that the work of the Lord can continue to go forward here in North America. And I believe that uh, by the help of the Lord, we will see, um, amen, goals reached and even exceeded. And so if you haven't given to Christmas for Christ or you can add a little bit to what you've given as we conclude today, amen, if you want to bring an offering down for the, uh, uh, to be given today, feel free to do so. Other than that, God bless you for being here. We've been in the presence of God today. We've heard from the Lord today. God is good. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you today. You may be dismissed.